Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this joint Landmark Chambers Herbert Smith Freehills webinar. This webinar follows our session on Section 73 applications. So to those who attended that webinar, uh, welcome back. Uh, my name is Neil Cameron. I'm going to chair the session today and I'm joined by Matthew White and Annika Holden, both of Herbert Smith Freehills and by Zach Simons of Landmark and I will introduce them in a moment. But to begin with, as people are joining, just a few housekeeping points. Your microphones are automatically muted, so you won't need to mute yourself. You're very much and welcome and encouraged to answer questions during the session. But if you do that, please can you use the Q&A button that the, should be at the bottom of your screen, but could be at the top. And we will try and answer as many questions as possible, but it depends on time and uh, whether uh, we can group questions together. At the end of the presentation, you'll receive a link and a recording so you can uh, watch again if you want to later. And if at any time your connection is lost during the webinar, what uh, you should do is to leave and rejoin by clicking on the original link. Now, turning to the subject of today's webinar, the issue of overlapping permissions has arisen uh, ever since the modern planning regime uh, was introduced. And although it's often said, and it's right, that the planning regime is a comprehensive statutory code, there are gaps, and this is one of them. And the judgment in the case of Pilkington which is really the classic case on this issue, was described by Lord Scarman in Pioneer as a rule formulated by the courts to support and strengthen uh, planning control imposed by the legislation. So the courts have come up with a solution to one of these gaps in the code. But the real issue, and one which we will discuss in this webinar is whether the solution that the courts have come up with is clear enough to provide a coherent answer which covers all of possible eventualities and whether if it does it provides a clear enough answer but we've got an array of expert panelists to answer that question and others uh, Matthew White uh, Matthew is partner in the Herbert Smith Freehills real estate team, head of planning in London. And he has advised on a multiplicity of high profile projects, including Stratford City, Hinkley Point C, BBC Television Centre, Canada Water Master Plan. And in recognition of all that, he appears in the Legal 500 Hall of Fame and is identified as a star individual for planning law in London in Chambers 2021 guide. Annika Holden is a senior associate in the London planning team at Herbert Smith Freehills and her recent experience includes a number of multi-phase regeneration projects which no doubt brought challenges uh, with overlapping consents or could have done uh, and they include redevelopment of the Tottenham Hale Centre Deptford Wharves and in addition to acting for developers Annika acts for purchasers and funders in acquiring and financing uh, development projects and then turning to Zach Simons. Zach is one of the most highly rated planning juniors in the country. He's got a wide-ranging practice housing infrastructure commercial development and compulsory purchase and that's on planning appeals and in the courts uh, and he appears in the courts at every level. So with that introduction 
I'm going to hand over first to Zach, and then we'll move on to Annika and then to Matthew. Zach. Thanks very much, Neil, and good, good evening, everyone. Right. Uh, here's a question for you all, start for 10. What happens when uh, two inconsistent planning permissions apply to the same site? It's a simple enough question. Answering it can get quite complicated. And the first thing to say, and this is a point that Neil made in his introductory uh, comments a moment ago, the answer does not appear in the statute books. As Neil said in his introduction, what you're going to be hearing about um, from the four of us for the next hour or so is how judges and practitioners have been trying for the last 75 years or more to fill these gaps in the planning system. And as you will see uh, over, the, over the next hour, the, the struggle is not over because there are still some really important questions uh, out there unanswered decades on with, with profound implications for the planning system. But uh, before we get to any of those, let's start with the basics and a, a very simple example, a tale of uh, three planning permissions, a single site running north, south, three bungalows, the Pilkington case. What actually happened in Pilkington? We're well, back in the early years of the uh, English planning system. In 1953, permission was granted to erect a bungalow uh, at the uh, northern end of the site with the rest of the site to the south shown on the plans as a small holding. That permission was not implemented. 1954, Mr Pilkington gets another planning permission. Same site, uh, same red line, different bungalow uh, this time uh, toward the middle of the site rather than rather than at the north, uh, with plans showing no other bungalows. And a little later, a third permission granted for yet another bungalow in the southern area of the site. Now, the second and third are implemented, so we end up with bungalows in the middle and at the bottom of the site. Could Mr Pilkington also have the one in the north, which had been permitted back in 1953? Now, the, the Secretary of State said no. He said that the later permission was inconsistent with an alternative to the earlier permission. So once the later permissions have been implemented, the earlier one becomes incapable of implementation. And the court said that that was correct. Mr Pilkington's right to erect a bungalow in the northern part of the site under the first permission had been lost. What's the starting point? The starting point is that developers can test the market by putting in all kinds of inconsistent applications for planning permission. If they do, uh, councils have to deal with each one on their merits, even if they're inconsistent with one another. And the job of the council is not to check for consistency unless one incorporates the other. Each application has to be judged on its own terms. So how, how did the court approach Mr. Pilkinson's case? In three big stages. First, uh, they look to see the full scope of that which has been done or can be done pursuant to the permission which has been implemented, permission A. Second, look at the development which was permitted in the second permission now sought to be implemented, permission B. And third, you ask yourself whether it's possible to carry out the development proposed in, condition, in permission B, having regard to that which has been done or authorised to be done under permission A, now, on the simple facts of Pilkington, the Northern Bungalow Permission could no longer be carried out as it had originally been envisaged because there were bungalows in what should have been the small holding area. So the earlier permission no longer capable of being implemented. So far, so straightforward. Well, let me give you a second example. Uh, 2003 now, planning permission granted for a two storey rear extension to a house with a new driveway. Uh, further permission was granted in 2005 to, among other things, construct a new house next to the existing house. And importantly, this new house would sit on part of the new driveway, which had been permitted in 2003. Work begins on both permissions. Uh, for the 2003 consent, a retaining wall was built. And for the 2005 consent, a new house was built. And in, in those circumstances, now we know that the 2003 scheme has been implemented. Tick. The question is whether it can now lawfully be completed. And this is the Singh case from the High Court in 2010. Mr Justice Hickenbottom, as he was then, uh, said something which in some ways has taken the law forward uh, in a direction that I'll, I'll tell you about in a few minutes. He said that for a development to be lawful, it's got to be carried out fully in accordance with any final permission under which it's done, failing which the whole development is unlawful. 
and by so doing he was referring back to the um to, to a case called sage in the supreme court to which we will return uh, and he said that that means that if a permitted development cannot be completed because of the impact of other operations under another permission that that subsequent development as a whole will be unlawful I remember that idea if a scheme can't be completed because of a pilkington problem that subsequent development as a whole will be unlawful we might need to return to what he what he meant by that uh, in, in a few minutes but on the facts of singh if the applicant wanted to build out the 2003 uh, scheme some sort of variation would be required under section 73 or section 96a and all very well you, you might think you might not for a single dwelling for a side extension but how does that principle about making sure the whole thing can be completed or the subsequent development as a whole becomes unlawful if it can't be completed uh, applied to more complicated pieces of development and this is when i fear we get into a bit of a tension in the more recent cases in 2015 in the court of appeal in a case called robert hitchens two identical permissions have been granted for a 200 home scheme in worcester the first required an £800,000 contribution to Worcestershire's transport strategy. The second did not. And that Worcestershire County Council wanted to make absolutely sure that the scheme was proceeding under the first permission and not the second in order to get their contribution. Their argument turned on this idea of a holistic approach to planning permissions. See this Singh case. They said the second planning permission covered the whole of the development, um, but that building operations on the site could not be carried out fully in accordance with the second permission because part of the development had already been carried out under the first planning permission. That was their argument, which meant Worcestershire submitted that any operations carried out under the second planning permission were unlawful, applying the idea from Singh. Was the Court of Appeal having that? Absolutely not. Uh, Lord Justice Richards said that the logic of the council's permission would mean that if planning permission was granted for 200 homes, of which 150 were progressively built out in accordance with plans and were occupied, all the dwellings so built and occupied would then be unlawful unless and until the remaining dwellings were built. And he said even if the 150 were all individually built in accordance with the plans uh, and there was no breach, of condition uh, uh, related to the permission and the court said that that kind of idea is totally unsupported by authority and it can't be right so hang on you might be thinking isn't there a bit of a problem here because the Singh case said you need to be uh, fully not only begun but completed in accordance with the permission to be lawful or else subsequent development is unlawful as a whole but a few years later the court of appeal says in the Robert Hitchens case that you can partially complete a scheme and what you've done can, in principle, be lawful. How do we make those cases sit together? Before we get to the, the most recent case, the Hillside case, let me give you just one more example. But we're, Lucas, for back uh, for just a moment, in the early days of the modern planning system in 1952, a permission was granted for 27 homes arranged around the cul-de-sac, not implemented. 1957, permission was granted for six homes on the same site, no cul-de-sac, two of those homes were built. Now, later on, the claimants proposed to rely on the old 1952 permission to build out the cul-de-sac. The court decided in Lucas that the earlier permission was not to be regarded in law as a permission to develop the plot as a whole, but rather for a permission to develop any bit of the development comprised in that permission. So it did therefore authorise partial development, just the cul-de-sac say, without the 27 homes. The court found that the legality of the scheme didn't depend on full completion. And the judge said something that I would regard as quite uh, important. The judge said, and remember, we're in the very early days of the, of the modern planning system here. He said that Parliament cannot have intended to leave individual owners of separate plots comprised in the contemplated total housing scheme dependent on completion of the whole of the scheme by the original developer or by some purchaser from him so that they'd be vulnerable with the whole scheme not completed separately to enforcement action which might deprive them of their houses and the money which they'd invested in those houses. Uh, he also said that otherwise it'd be very difficult at any given moment to say that the development already achieved was permitted development or not insofar as uh, that could be said to depend on the intention of the developer, i.e. whether the whole scheme was going to be built out. 
Now, the logic uh, behind Lucas, you might think, sounds an awful lot like common sense. Uh, it also, perhaps more importantly, sounds similar to the logic of the Court of Appeal many decades later in the Robert Hitchens case. But Lucas does not represent the law of the land. You, you need to know that it was considered uh, in the Pilkington judgment. The court called it rather exceptional there in turning on an unusual view of the facts of a particular planning permission. The Lucas approach has not been relied on uh, by other judges over the, uh, the, the years to build out a broader understanding of the law in this area. And it did not hold the day most recently in the Hillside case. Uh, so finally then we arrive at Hillside the reason we're all here. Um, what actually happened in the Hillside case? What did the court decide? Well, in 1967, uh, permission was granted for 401 homes in the Abu Dhabi, uh, on the Dhabi estuary in glorious Snowdonia. Now, a number of different planning permissions were granted over the early 1970s, which allowed variations in the layout of the uh, original 1967 master plan, albeit there was not at that time any statutory power to vary permissions or conditions. A range of further variations were granted by Snowdonia National Park Authority, who became the local planning authority uh, in 1996, the Hillside Parks, who'd taken over the site uh, in the 1990s and into the first decades of the, of the 2000s. The, permit the permissions were expressly granted as variations on the footing that they had the effect of varying the original master plan. But notwithstanding all of that, we get all the way up to 2017 and Snowdonia contacts Hillside to say that the 1967 permission could no longer be implemented because the various bits of development carried out in accordance with the long list of later planning permissions rendered it impossible to implement this original master plan. And the High Court, the judge decided that the development permitted by the 1967 permission can, could not now be completed lawfully in accordance with that permission that was physically impossible to complete. Not a, ma not, not a matter, the judge said, of minor deviations. A fresh design was required, a new layout would be needed. The scheme was no longer physically possible. And the Court of Appeal agreed. It reviewed the plans. It held that development which had actually taken place consists not only of a, a different type of housing, with a different alignment, but it included new roads, which would be clearly incompatible with the original master plan. Is any of that particularly new or exciting? Not really. It's a conventional application of the Pilkington principles to a slightly more intricate and involved set of facts and certainly a much more, much more complicated scheme. But... It doesn't end there. The Court of Appeal decided to approve the comments in Singh that if a development for which permission has been granted can't be completed because of the impact of other operations under another permission, that subsequent development as a whole will be unlawful. But the court then raised the question of what that comment actually means. Does it mean that all the development which has already taken place, apparently in accordance with the first grant of permission, is rendered unlawful simply by virtue of the fact that subsequent operations take place pursuant to another permission which is inconsistent with the first. And if that were right, if the whole thing can be rendered unlawful, does that leave open the risk of enforcement action and possible criminal liability in respect of development which has already taken place, even though that development was lawfully done at the time in accordance with a valid planning permission. Remember, that's exactly the kind of idea which the Court of Appeal kicked into touch uh, with the Robert Hitchens case. So what did the Court of Appeal decide about this question in Hillside? What's the, what's the answer? They decided not to decide. They kicked the can down the road. They raised the issue, but then left it floating. And the question for us now, uh, is whether the Supreme Court will decide to uh, examine that issue afresh uh, in the Hillside case if they grant permission, which is something on which we should hear quite soon in the next few weeks. Um, the Court of Appeal in Hillside also strongly doubted the, the pick and choose approach endorsed in Lucas for modern planning permissions for the development of large housing estates because the court said there may well be other requirements concerning highways, landscaping, employment, educational uses, all sorts, which are stipulated to be part, an integral part of the overall scheme permitted 
So unlike uh, the findings in Lucas for a modern day planning permission, the court said you can't just do a bit, pick and choose which bit you do. Where does the law stand today? In a state of at least uncertainty and potentially some flux, we know about the basic operation of the Pilkington principle. If permissions clash, you can't build them both. What we don't know, what we don't know for sure, is where the law will end up on the consequences of that principle operating. So um, if you can't lawfully complete a scheme because of the operation of the, of the Pilkington principle, are the bits which you've already done legal or not? It's a big question, which I've certainly got a view on, um, but which the courts have yet to answer uh, definitively. And that's my that's my sort of run through the cases. And I'm going to pass the baton on uh, to Annika, who's going to tell us about some of the practical implications of how those cases work through on the ground. Uh, Annika, over to you. Thank you very much, Zach. So Zach has explained how a bungalow consented 70 years ago in Lancashire has cast a long shadow over the planning system. And I'm going to try and explain how the principles that have been discussed, these abstract principles, play out day to day in the development world. And that's giving us our starting point. Any number of planning applications may be made in respect of an area of land. Any number of planning permissions may be granted. It's not the job of the local planning authority to determine whether proposals are consistent. Um, and Chief Justice Widgery said in Pilkington that an officer doing this would be displaying unnecessary officiousness. But that means that it falls to the landowner to assess the consistency of overlapping planning permissions. We need to determine the extent to which the validity of those permissions might be affected by the case law principles set out in the Pilkington line of cases. The risk lies with the developer. So we know Pilkington impacts on, on overlapping planning permissions where they're inconsistent. How do we assess inconsistency? As, as Zach noted, Pilkington set out a step-by-step -step process that seems very simple. Um, permission A, which is the implemented permission, look to see the full scope of that which has been done or can be done pursuant to that permission. In respect to permission B, uh, look at what might be done pursuant to permission B. Is it possible to carry out permission development pursuant to permission B, having regard to what can be or has been done under permission A? If no, permission B is incapable of implementation. And as Zach has laid out, the case law provides a further few clues as to what we need to consider. So when we're looking at inconsistency, the most obvious starting point is physical inconsistency. And what Singh shows us is that this can be minor. Um, in that case, one of the physical inconsistencies was that a turning area for a driveway under one of the permissions couldn't be constructed as approved because part of it was in the garden area of the new dwelling. And another inconsistency was that the garden under one permission couldn't be laid out as approved because it was in the garden of the second permission. So the physical inconsistencies can be minor, we know that. The second is conditions. You need to be able to comply in full with the conditions of both permissions or there will be inconsistency. This overlaps with the previous point, of course, because conditions will often require compliance with approved plans. But you can imagine other circumstances where a condition, for example, requiring that an area of land be kept free from development um, could be inconsistent with a later permission that proposes development on that area. And the third, which is almost another way, I think, of saying the same thing as the preceding two principles, which is asking whether the both planning permissions can be completed fully in accordance with their terms. So these are three ways of essentially saying the same thing. Are, are the permissions consistent or not? So does this obscure legal principle cause problems for modern projects? Absolutely, yes. Um, the most common way that it arises in is in relation to planning permissions for larger developments where development is split into discrete plots. Um, it's quite common for part of the development to be carried out pursuant to an original permission, but then for a full new planning permission to be obtained for just one plot. So I've put a very basic example up here on the slide. Um, you, here you have a 2008 planning permission for six plots. Let's imagine that 
five plots are built, there's a change in market demand. Sorry, there's two plot fours I've just realized on this slide. Um, but let's imagine one of them is plot five. Um, there's a change in market demand. The developer decides to do something different with plot six. That change is a fundamental alteration. So we know from the previous seminar that Arrowcroft says that section 73 can't be used. So they get a new permission in 2012 for plot six, but the Pilkington line of cases tells us that the 2012 permission can't be lawfully implemented because there's physical inconsistency. So we're in a bit of a bind if you're a developer. We know from our previous seminar that post the Court of Appeal decision in Finney, the legal test for whether you can use Section 73 have gotten harder. And we know that Lord Justice Lewison in Finney said the answer is a new planning permission. But we also know that when you do apply for a new permission, any physical inconsistency will render development under the unimplemented permission unlawful. And of course, if you want to make a variation for operational development, there will be physical inconsistency. That's the whole point of the variation. So what are we meant to do? Enter the drop-in or the slot-in. Um, what this is, is it's basically a legal structure that can be established to allow two permissions to be implemented without being caught by the doctrine in Pilkington. Our aim is up here on the slide. Um, we need to facilitate the two permissions to be severable and entirely independent of each other and with each granted consent in contemplation of the other. Even though they're a relatively common practice in relation to large master plan sites, and I'm sure all of you will have heard of this concept, the use of slot in slot out mechanisms is not formally recognised in statute, just like the Pilkington principle itself, case law or modern planning guidance. There is therefore always an element of risk involved in using a mechanism like this, since there will continue to be physical overlap between the red line boundary of the existing planning permission and the red line boundary of the new slotted in planning permission. So what steps would we take if we wanted to implement this structure? First, we need to consider whether it's possible to physically separate the two elements of the development. A red line would need to be drawn which physically delineates the two sites as if they were two separate planning applications. Secondly, the planning conditions governing the two developments also need to be completely independent. This is so that when a new application is submitted, it's unambiguously clear which conditions on the existing planning permission are superseded and which remain binding in relation to the original development. Thirdly, a new planning application should be submitted, which makes it clear on its face that it expressly contemplates the original development. Fourthly, the Section 106 agreement would need to be amended to exclude the area that's now to be developed pursuant to the new permission and a new separate Section 106 agreement entered into in relation to the new development. And then you would insert informatives on both permissions, um, which contain express statements saying that the permissions have been granted in contemplation of the other. This is all a bit abstract. Um, so let's look back at the previous example, the uh, permission with, with two plot fours. So we're trying to split the development into two parts. So phase A would be plots one to five, assuming there was a plot five, and phase B would be plot six. So to achieve this separation of conditions and physical independence, a section 96 or section 73 application would need to be submitted, which splits the existing conditions into two parts. The phase A conditions would relate to plots one to five, the phase B conditions would relate to plot six. That would involve duplication um, of the existing conditions, but that's necessary to achieve the independence of development that's required. Usually on the basis that the conditions aren't being changed in substance, often this kind of split can be achieved by way of a section 96A application. That's obviously subject though to the steps that need to be taken to achieve physical independence and also the nature of the conditions themselves. The new application for plot six should expressly contemplate plots one to five and it should expressly say it's intended to replace the existing plot six. The section 106 agreement for the 2008 permission would be amended to release plot six from the obligations under the section 106 for the main site. A new section 106 would be entered into for plot six only. The section 106 for the main planning permission should also contain a covenant 
not to carry out development of plot six under the main permission in the event that the new plot six permission is implemented. So even though it's often called a drop in or a slot in, it really needs to be called a slot in slot out mechanism because the slotting out is very important. And just to end on a key point, returning to something I said earlier, this slot in slot out mechanism is widely practiced, but it doesn't have a formal basis. So there's always a level of residual risk. And the strategy, as I just set out, is quite complicated. It needs careful design, it needs input from lawyers. That makes it expensive and it's costly in terms of time as well. So from a developer's point of view, it's quite an unsatisfactory position. With that, I'll hand over to my colleague, Matthew White, who will talk about some possibilities for law reform. Thank you very much, Annika. Um, and I'm going to follow Annika's excellent outline of the practical issues caused by Pilkington and Hillside um, with some ideas about what we could do to make these difficult questions go away. And um, the picture you see on this slide is the seafront in Abu Dhabi in Wales, which is where the Hillside site can be found. And I, I think it looks like a lovely spot and definitely one for your um, list of places to visit post lockdown. So in many ways, it is um, astounding that we are still talking about this. Um, Pilkington was heard in the High Court in uh, October 1973. And as you heard from Zach, it concerns whether a planning permission granted in 1954 was still capable of implementation. And the 1954 permission authorised um, a bungalow uh, and a garage in Walker Lane, Fullwood and Preston. And I can't tell you that this is one of the bungalows uh, that the case concerned, but it is a bungalow on Walker Lane, so it is possible. And that gives you the idea of the sort of scale of building that we were, we were considering in Pilkington. And I think it's inconceivable that Mr Pilkington, the owner of the land in 1973, nor either of his barristers, George Dobry, QC, and his junior, a certain Robert Carnworth, would have realised the impact the case would have. And nearly 40 years later, 66 years after the planning permission in question was granted, we're still grappling with the consequences. And to me, that's a very clear indication that the current situation is not sustainable and there is a definite need for statutory clarification and ideally reform. So Annika's explained the practical problems that Pilkington creates, and I'm not gonna repeat those here, but it's worth asking, why bother? Is there anything here actually worth protecting? And my answer to that is yes, definitely. Landowners in this country have the right to apply for as many planning permissions as they wish for the development of their land, or indeed somebody else's land, and that's a very valuable right. We could have a simple rule where the grant of planning permission would immediately override any previous planning permission to the extent that development has not already been completed. That would deal with the problem that Pilkington addresses quite satisfactorily. But it would remove flexibility for landowners to test different ideas with planning authorities uh, and it would remove their choice of which one to implement. And I think that would be a grave loss indeed. So we definitely need a rule to deal with what happens when there are inconsistent planning permissions relating to the same land. When one is implemented, what happens to the other? And as Zach said, Lord Scarman recognised in Pilkington that the court had to formulate a rule precisely because it wasn't dealt with in the planning legislations. In other words, the court stepped in to plug a gap in the statutory code. The problem is that plug is leaking. So Lord Scarman thought there was no uncertainty arising from the application of the rule. It was an easy task to examine planning permissions on a public register and inspect the relevant land to reveal whether development has been carried out, which renders a planning permission um, incapable of implementation. But the world has moved on. Planning permissions are significantly more complex now, and anyone who looks at the planning register is confronted with hundreds of documents in some cases. Um, this is Canada Water, for example, British Land's plans for a new town centre in London. And you can see by comparing back to the uh, slide earlier of a bungalow in Preston that we really are a quantum leap from that in the scale of applications that are now coming forward. 
And in today's sophisticated development market, planning permissions cover large sites with many phases of development, documents that fill an entire room and are subject to hundreds of conditions and obligations. So that examination process that was envisaged by Lord Scarman would simply be impossible today. So in my opinion, the rule formulated by the courts to plug the gap in the planning code is no longer fit for purpose. And it now in turn needs to be replaced or supplemented by legislation. So what can be done? Well, in our last presentation, I set out proposals for a new specific power to vary planning permissions, uh, whether they're material or non-material amendments. And if such a power were available, it would reduce the need to apply for a Section 73 permission or, if, or to make a new planning application in order to secure variations to a permitted development. And that's where a lot of, plan a lot of Pilkington issues arise. Developers try to vary their developments in response to changes in market conditions. And the use of drop-in applications, as explained by Annika, is an example of this in practice. So by allowing variations directly, instead of requiring new applications um, to be submitted and granted for the same land, would reduce the scale of the problem. But it wouldn't deal with the issue altogether. So the lacuna in the statutory code would still exist and apply wherever there are overlapping permissions. Uh, there's one passage in Pilkington though, which is I think very helpful. Lord Widgery recognised that there are special cases where one application deliberately and expressly refers to or incorporates another. And it's at least arguable that permissions in that category sit outside of and are not subject to the Pilkington rule. So one idea for reform would be to introduce a new power when applying for a new planning permission to refer to an existing permission and then expressly apply to supersede any unimplemented development authorised by that permission. And the object of that would be to avoid any inconsistency arising by tackling it head on when the new permission is granted. So to give you an example, here is an existing planning permission for 24 houses. I know they look a bit like space invaders, but I'm a lawyer, not an architect. And the developers actually built six houses on the eastern part of the site already in a range of attractive colours, as you can see. The remaining 18 houses have not yet been developed uh, as a result of a downturn in the market. So the developer wants to change her plans and move into the build to rent market instead. So she applies to supersede the authorised development on the western part of the site, at the same time as submitting a new planning application for that part of the site. And the application to supersede is approved at the same time as the new plans for that part of the site are approved. In this case, it's an attractive courtyard development around a, a central lake, I think. And so the two developments can sit side by side without any inconsistency. The developer can continue to complete the remaining six houses on the eastern site, as you see here, without any fear that the permission for those houses is no longer capable of implementation nor that the houses that have already been built would retrospectively be rendered unlawful, which is the Singh problem that you heard about earlier. And so effectively what I'm saying is that this would codify the slot out procedure that Annika described earlier. Now, I can see that this might be used as, an, as a weapon, uh, somebody who you know, wants to stop an application or uh, permission proceeding applies to supersede it. So I think it would be necessary to own the land on which the development is being superseded, or at least to secure the owner's agreement. But that's no different to what's required for a Section 96A application already, so it ought to be possible. I also think it should only be possible to supersede the part of a development which remains undeveloped, where construction of a building has already begun, a variation should be applied for instead. And the new application would, of course, need to demonstrate how the new development would tie into the existing and authorised development, just as any development on an adjoining site would have to. And that might necessitate amendments to the existing permission alongside the grant of the new permission. And I did think about whether you could do this through a Section 106 agreement instead, but I think that would be less transparent and the agreement would be open to a future modification, which would complicate matters, um, potentially. <clears throat> 
And I also don't think that would fall within the exception I mentioned in Pilkington of one application deliberately and expressly referring to another. So a new power along these lines would give developers the opportunity to submit a new planning application for part of a site where this is preferable to varying the existing planning permission or where a variation is not possible because of Finney, for example. And that would resolve the problems that Zach and Annika explained earlier and would make most of the difficult questions coming from Pilkington go away, which I'm sure would be widely welcomed by developers and local planning authorities alike. And with that, I'll say back to you, Neil. Well, thank you very much to all our speakers. I think, Matthew, I was going to recommend that you uh, join the Law Commission with all your proposals for reform. But now that I've seen the designs, I think really it's uh, as a designer. Um, and there we go, you're back on again. So we've had some questions. Um, so thank you very much for all those who've submitted questions. And I'd like to start with one um, which is about the Sing Hillside point. And the, uh, the question is this, how does the Sing Hillside suggestion that development needs to be completed sit alongside the long-standing orthodoxy of policy guidance, policy and guidance, that planning authorities shouldn't impose conditions requiring development to be completed. Um, and I think, Zach, if we can come to you first on this and then turn to other people. And can I add um, a little extra to that question? I mean, it's added to that, it's slightly ironic that there is a system for a completion notice, but a completion notice doesn't require you to complete. It just says you can't do any more. Um, but, and Sing, I mean, you've referred to the, as a whole, but why can't Sing just mean that if you get an inconsistent planning permission, which you implement, that which you've done under your old permission is lawful, but anything subsequent is isn't isn't wouldn't that be perfectly simple it would yes it would be per so simple that it managed to evade a clear finding in the court of appeal but yes as, as it would be a, a very happy resolution of the problem um uh, it, it, a number of issues uh, wrapped into that question uh, it's a very good question i think the the planning practice guidance on conditions tells us that you know we're, we're not supposed to impose uh, conditions which require development to be carried out in full because those sorts of conditions won't be necessary because they'll go further than is required to deal uh, with the problem that they're designed to solve and also because they're likely to be difficult to enforce because of the range of external factors that can influence a decision on whether or not to carry out and complete a development that's all in, from the ppg which makes it it pretty clear at least in the view of central government that it's not somehow sort of inherent in every grant of planning permission that that you know you need to lawfully to complete every scheme in full and we can take it a bit further noting your point neil about completion notices it's quite right under section 94 of the, um, of the 1990 Act, local authorities have a power that's at the moment it's subject to Secretary of State approval to serve completion notices saying that the planning permission will cease to have effect at the end of the expiration of a, of a period specified in the notice. That's in where they're of the opinion that a development won't be completed within a reasonable period. Now in Hitchens, the Court of Appeal said that the existence of that power uh, implies that a development may be commenced but not completed yet still remain lawful since otherwise you wouldn't need the notice provisions at all the court of appeal said you could just rely on normal powers of enforcement in respect of unlawful development which again is is, is quite right the problem really i think comes back to sage in the house of lords that was a case that that, that influenced and, uh, and was sort of expanded on and if you like in the singh decision sage in the house of lords was a case all about substantial completion and what that means but really important point sage was an enforcement case 
where the idea of substantial completion is a really important statutory test for time running for the accrual of immunity under section 171b uh, for the under the enforcement provisions of the 1990 Act. That was there, but there's no more general requirement in other parts of the statute to complete developments, and that's not a part of the statutory code. And it's right that the court in SAGE said that if a building operation is, is not carried out, both externally and internally, fully in accordance with the permission, the whole operation is unlawful. But again, as I said earlier on, okay, number one, that's in the context of an enforcement case, and also it's in the context of really references to individual building operations, not to more complicated multi-phase developments. Um, such as those that Annika and Matthew have been have been talking about. So in the end, Neil, I, I agree that a more sensible and certainly uh, commercially workable interpretation of the Singh judgment would be to focus on the subsequent development bit and perhaps sort of put to one side the idea of it being as a whole, because it's if you sort of overread or put a bit too much emphasis on the idea of as a whole, i.e. including the things that have already been done lawfully, that things start to get a little bit sticky. Unless you just say the as a whole means all the subsequent development. Yes. Again, had the Court of Appeal uh, clarified it in that way, I think we, we, we probably wouldn't have so much to talk about at this webinar, but yes, quite right. Okay. Can I just on that theme turn to you, Annika, and just on the practicalities of this, and we all talk about it and we've been discussing it uh, in some detail, but in the practical world, you're advising a funder or a intending purchaser, and you come across a site where there are all these overlapping planning permissions how do you deal with it? How do you steer them through that course? I think people quite like to, to know how you deal with that. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question. There is, I think, a distinction between if we're looking to buy or advising on buying or funding a site where the, the relevant planning permission that contains the value hasn't yet been implemented, or if we're looking at buying a, a built site where there's a mishmash of planning permissions, it looks like there's a historic Pilkington problem, but actually the development's all built. Um, and I think in terms of levels of risk, if a planning permission with a Pilkington problem has been granted and you're in the JR period, that's, you know, in our planning lawyer world of red flags, that's, that's a red flag and quite a high level red flag. If it hasn't been implemented, you're still looking at, I think, quite a high level of risk. But as if the development's been built, um, then actually with, we're into the realm of thinking about, is it realistic that there would be enforcement action here? Would this be a reasonable course of action for an authority to take? And most of the time, bearing in mind the circumstances, we will come to the view that actually, no, it's very unlikely that a planning authority is going to take enforcement action. So I think that gels quite nicely with, with Zach's point, because if that was the law, <laughs> that would match very clearly what the practice is. Um, and in terms of how a funder might think about it, I think they would think about it in those different ways as well. Um, so yeah, distinction between a fresh permission that hasn't yet been implemented, maybe is in the JR period and you're trying to buy that value, that's a big problem. If you're looking at a site that everything's been built out, um, then we're talking about a lower level of risk and you can take a bit more of a view on it. Yeah. Um, Matthew, have you got a view on that point or anything you want to add on that? Yeah, I, I mean, look, I think Annika's absolutely right. And it, I suppose it, on the funding, I, we were relatively comfortable until we read that bit in Hillside that started to question um, a development that's already been built. And, and that really sort of set the alarm bells ringing, albeit it was left as an open question. So I think it would be very helpful if the uh, Supreme Court were to, to clarify that point, because it's, it is quite alarming. Um, but it comes up more often, I think, on, on um, new development uh, where you're trying to structure um, a permission in order to allow for future variations to, to reflect changes in the market, which of course is a huge issue at the moment. Yeah. Uh, one of the questions that we've been asked is about how do you use the uh, lawful development certificate 
uh, route. So if you've got a uh, existing planning permission, uh, do you then get a lawful development certificate to well, certificate of lawfulness of existing use or development of the part of the development that's completed? And could you then use, I'm adding to the question, the proposed use or development to deal with the rest of the site? Is that the way to obtain clarity or is that just going to add to complexity? Can I hand that to, who would like to deal with that one? Matthew, um, you look so you're- well, I'm, I'm happy to say something on that, which is, yes, I suppose you could, but you know, we're talking here about developments that have been granted planning permission and are carried out in accordance with that planning permission. And it seems remarkable if, if we're in the state of affairs where you build in accordance with the planning permission and then you have to go and get a certificate to say that what you've done is lawful. That can't be right. Well, it seems to me unduly onerous. Why should you have to do that? You've got your planning permission. Um, one of the other questions we've got, perhaps I'll pass this to Annika on the practical level, uh, where somebody's raised the point about what happens if you have an outline planning permission, uh, you then get a full planning permission, not quite clear whether that question relates to all or part of the site, and then somebody comes in for reserve matters on the outline. Um, I mean, it seems to me that what matters is what can you implement rather than what you apply for, but does the outline full planning permission cause any issues? I mean, how do you how do you determine physical impossibility on a, if you get an outline? Um, I think you'd, you'd look at the parameter plans on the outline because um, they would have a, a level of um, development that it needs to be within those parameters. And I think from there, actually, it would be a reasonably straightforward Pilkington analysis that you'd be looking at quite in a quite a similar way to uh, my very impressive diagram of, of different plots um, <laughs> in a development. Um, I, I think, but what that question demonstrates, thing, I think, is almost the absurdity of, of what we're dealing with, where you, you do have different plots, they are distinct. And the idea that you can't apply for full planning permission in respect of one of them and then apply for reserve matters in respect of another, and you have to implement quite a um, complex legal structure of the kind I was talking about, I think shows that we're not in a very good place um, in, in respect of this area of law, I think. Yeah, I think you're right. Well, shall we go on to the place we should be in, which is Matthew's uh, reform proposals. Uh, one of the questions we've had is asking about whether if you have this new ability to make a further and different type of application, that causes some kind of uh, mission creep in that uh, applicants or developers will be testing out all sorts of different schemes. How can you guard against that? Um, so I've got three points on that. The first one is that is exactly what um, was was being protected uh, in, you know, is what uh, Lord Scarman said uh, uh, was was the applicant's right to test um, different ideas. So, you know, I, I think we have to protect that very, very um, jealously guard it because that's one of the benefits of our planning system. Um, secondly, the planning authority still retains discretion to determine planning applications in accordance with their plan and planning policy and guidance. And no one's saying we will take that away from them. So, you know, there's no mission creep in that landowners already have a right to apply for planning permission and authorities will then determine those applications in the usual way. And thirdly, this is happening already. You know, we are already seeing that permissions are granted for big, complicated, multi-phase schemes, uh, which are developed out over a decade or more. and of course, things change. You know, the world is becoming less and less predictable as, as time goes on. And we need a system that will recognize that and be, a, be flexible enough to allow developers to change their schemes with, with relatively limited um, a burden, provided they meet all the requirements of the statutory code. And I'm afraid what's happening is that more and more barriers are being placed in the way of them doing that 
um, and no one really benefits. You know, local authorities don't benefit because of the bureaucracy they're placed under. Developers don't benefit because their life's made impossible. Um, and local residents don't benefit because they say, we just don't understand what's going on here. We just want to know what's going to be built. Well, this sort of idea of reform, I think, helps those issues. Yeah. Can I go um, back to something that you raised, Annika, about your, I found your, um, say it shouldn't be a slot in, it should be a slot in, slot out uh, mechanism. That was a really good point, I thought. And what I'm interested in, and perhaps you can help us on, is how do you deal with the existing permission? Because you're saying you've got to deal with both. So the new permission, you can say, this is intended to be a slot in using whatever words you do. It's intended to be compatible. It's going to be plot six or plot seven replacement. But how do you change the original permission? You mentioned section 96A, but how do you use that to ensure compatibility? Yes, so the first, and I mentioned it in my part of the talk, it's very important to effectively split the permission into two parts. So phase um, part A and part B. And often what you'll have is it looks quite artificial. You'll have almost exactly the same conditions in the same words, but some apply to part A and, and, and they apply to part B. And that's part of, um, of achieving this split. The section 106 as well is important. So I think what is quite key is this obligation not to build anything on the relevant plot that's being slotted out once the new permission is implemented. That creates the link that's quite an important link. And then you'd hope to put um, an informative as well um, once the section 96A is granted. Um, and there's a, you know, you could come up with a form of words. I don't think there's any particular art to it, but it's just making clear that they um, express, um, expressly consider each other. I think also the officer's report, I didn't mention it in my, um, you would, you would want these issues to be considered in the officer's report. So there is quite a clear paper trail, actually, conditions, section 106, informative, officer's report, making clear that these are two permissions granted in contemplation of each other and that are consistent with each other. It sounds to me that the way you're going to do it, because we're looking at going back to Pioneer, uh, additions to the statutory code, the informative is an addition, we tell it's of no legal effect, but it's useful. Um, the 106 it operates outside the planning permission, which, but it would be very effective. So perhaps if you're going to do it completely within the code, it's rather 96A, do you need a section 73 to change the conditions on the original permission? And then you can be absolutely sure you've got your slot in and slot out. That's a very interesting point, but we're often going to have a finny problem, aren't we? Which, <laughs> which circles us right back to our last seminar. Matthew, I don't know whether you have a view on that. Yes, I agree. <laughs> it's very unsatisfactory. <laughs> so I think the answer is we need, we need legislation and Matthew's going to draft it for us. But on that, Matthew, if you do have legislation, um, do you have or should you have some provision equivalent to section 73, subsection two, which is to restrict the range of considerations that are applied. So you just don't open it all up again mm -hmm. um, and give either local residents false hope or place too great a burden on local authorities or on applicants. Yeah, so what I had in mind was that this application to supersede development would only ever come forward at the same time as an application for new development on that part of the site. So you can't independently apply to supersede development. It's only where you have an application for new development that necessitates uh, the doing away with what's gone before. Um, and actually, I, I thought that possibly an approach similar to Section 247 of the Act is, a, is, is one way of looking at it and saying, you know, the application will only be granted where necessary to facilitate, to make room for the new development. Um, and so you're not actually getting into issues of policy. All of those policy questions would arise in terms of 
granting permission or not for the new development that is proposed. And then if the answer to that is, yes, this should go ahead, you supersede the development as a necessary step towards that grant. So that, that's how it sort of, it was in my head. Um, but, you know, though I'm sure there are many, many considerations I haven't thought about. No, well, it's, but it appears to me that some solution is needed. Um, Sat, would you like to add anything on that? No, I agree that some solution is is needed. I mean, it'll be very interesting, genuinely very interesting to see, number one, whether or not the Hillside case gets taken forward to the Supreme Court. And number two, and we don't know the answer yet as to whether or not the um, court's going to grant permission. Number two, if it were to be taken forward, whether or not this point that we've spent all, all evening discussing is actually going to be ventilated much in the in, in that hearing at all because it's 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 the point which is of you know the point about um uh, com completing the subsequent development as a whole and all the rest of it has got has got us talking got, got got lots of practitioners in the industry talking but actually it was a point which was outside the ratio of the court's you know decision it was some obiter sort of speculation that the court didn't actually end up reaching a final view on if the supreme court granted permission then just went along and upheld the Court of Appeal, sent the central thrust of their reasoning. You could decide this case without needing to get into these thorny issues, but I rather hope that they do, I must say. So is the solution, and this is the last question that we deal with, and it's a question we've just received, uh, does the solution lie in the hands of the Supreme Court if uh, permission to appeal is granted? Can, on Hillside, do they have enough scope to resolve this, apart from my suggestion on the Singh approach, which is uh, that which has been done is yeah. awful, and it's that which has not been done, which is yeah. subsequent, and the as a whole refers yeah. to the subsequent. There's no doubt uh, that they could they could make that clear, they could make the, ca the Cameron approach <laughs> law, which, which I think, you know, would be very sensible. But that, in the end, that only takes us so far. It, that, that would that would get us to the next problem, if you like. But I still think Matthew's right to say that it is slightly odd that here we are, decades, decades after Pilkington struggling, try, you know, trying to work out how these cases apply in, in each time to individual facts. So, I've got to say, for, for for my money, if there's a solution, although the Supreme Court could get us over this road bump, I think I think that you know the solution should be legislative at the end of the day. Well, thank you very much. I think we have passed six o'clock, which is our time to finish. So thank you very much to all our panellists and thank you to those who've uh, organised the Zooming because it's all gone perfectly as far as I can see. So uh, thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Annika. And thank you, Zach. And thank you, everybody else who's uh, tuned in. Goodbye. Thank you.